Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Benjamin Unger, and I'm a, an assistant professor in the Department of Dermatology in the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Uh, and today I'll be presenting new advances in rosacea and seborrheic dermatitis. Um, you know, and, and as I go through this talk, um, I want to focus on rosacea and seborrheic dermatitis from the perspective of a kind of a translational mindset, you know, understanding what we know about the diseases in terms of the, the pathophysiology, um, how that can inform new treatments in the future, and conversely, how new treatments and successes and failures can inform our understanding of the disease uh, pathophysiology in both cases. So uh, here are my disclosures. So I'm actually gonna begin with seborrheic dermatitis uh, because I think from some perspectives, it's a little more straightforward than rosacea. So just for you know, some reminders and backgrounds to understand you know, what seborrheic dermatitis is, why it's important to understand the disease better and ultimately develop new treatments, we'll go through the clinical characteristics. So um, it's a chronic inflammatory skin disease. It's characterized by scaling, erythema, and pruritus. Uh, typically, it occurs in areas of high concentrations of sebaceous glands, uh, you know, so primarily scalp, glabella, eyebrows, nasolabial folds, uh, but it can certainly affect other areas of the body as well. Uh, it's estimated to affect, you know, 90, uh, the face in about 90% of cases, the scalp in 70% of cases, uh, but it should be noted that other areas of the bodies, like the chest, still can have involvement uh, very frequently. Uh, seborrheic dermatitis is a very common condition. You know, the prevalence estimates um, vary, of course, but uh, some studies look at one to 3% of the adult population, you know, millions of people in the US. Uh, some studies estimated at as high as 10%. Um, other studies look at worldwide prevalence at about 5%. And, you know, depending on how you look at it, if you consider dandruff to be on the uh, SD spectrum, then, you know, upwards of 50% of the population can be affected. The distribution in terms of age, uh, you know, there, it occurs most commonly during infancy, puberty, and in the 40 to 60 years of, uh, of age range, there is increased incidence in the number of uh, conditions. So certain, certain neurological conditions, such as Parkinson's disease, uh, HIV positive individuals. And it's also important to note here that it's frequently associated with rosacea. And that has implications for uh, different treatments because um, often treating seborrheic dermatitis will also necessitate thinking about treatments for rosacea, and they may not always be the same. I also wanna emphasize here that seborrheic dermatitis in skin of color is very common. So prevalence of about 6.5% uh, in African-Americans. Um, it's most common among black women in the US. Uh, one study found that seborrheic dermatitis was among the five most common diagnoses observed in black patients. Um, it's also important to remember that presentations can vary. So it can present with a hypo, hypopigmentation in addition to hyperpigmentation and various other clinical phenotypes. So the pathomechanisms underlying seborrheic dermatitis are not yet very well characterized. There have been a few preliminary studies that give us some insights, uh, but in general, it's not yet well characterized. Um, that's a work in progress and hopefully you know, in the upcoming months and years, we'll have more information and new data to support uh, the underlying pathomechanisms. Some things that are known to at least contribute to one extent or another include sebaceous gland uh, secretion of lipids, which are cleaved uh, by uh, malassezia lipases into pro-inflammatory free fatty acids. There's also upregulation of multiple cytokines and immune axes. Um, the specific axes and um, polar subsets of you know, T cells and others have not yet been very firmly identified. And there's some degree of skin barrier disruption as well. And these, uh, all these factors can contribute and you know, produce uh, feedback cycles, feed forward cycles, and, and uh, contribute to the ongoing uh, disease pathology. So the current treatment landscape is not very extensive. And I think it's important to understand that because there is this need still for new treatments. So typically first-line treatments include uh, over-the-counter shampoos, topical antifungals, and topical steroids. Topical calcineurin inhibitors um, can be used in some cases as well, but they're, they're often ineffective uh, and can be accompanied by uh, side effects like burning and stinging. As I mentioned before, you know, treatments for sebderm should be considered in the context of rosacea for many patients as well, and topical steroids can worsen rosacea. So these are uh, often not 
a great option for patients in addition to the safety concerns for long-term use on the face. So overall, again, there's this unmet need for moderate to severe uh, seborrheic dermatitis treatments. Uh, and you know, I think to, uh, for many people, even in the milder cases, an effective long-term non-steroidal safe for use uh, on a consistent basis would be very uh, welcome as well. So there are some investigational treatments, and I think we're, we're entering um, a phase where this is gonna expand. Uh, this was one preliminary study that kind of demonstrated a proof of concept for PDE4 inhibition uh, in the treatment using crisabrol. So there were 30 patients treated for four weeks, and we can see here that a pretty large percentage of the patients had an improvement in their um, IgE for, uh, for sebderm. Um, looking at different kinds of components of the disease, so erythema, scale, dryness, and pruritus, again, all of these components saw improvement um, over that time frame with crisabrol. And so that brings us to the, the kind of a most advanced investigational treatment uh, currently, which is reflumolas, a different PDE4 inhibitor, which is approved for psoriasis. Um, and in, in a phase two study with you know, 226 patients, um, it was shown that almost 75% of people achieved an IgA success. So that, that is um, you know, a very high proportion of uh, patients. And then looking at different components again, we see you know, 45% with an erythema success, uh, over 50% with scaling success, and the itch component as well, um, nearly 65% had a, a successful treatment with, uh, in terms of itch. Um, it's very important to note, again, that there were low rates of treatment-related adverse events. Um, this is very crucial on the face for potential long-term treatment. Um, and then in terms of the, the actual drug versus uh, vehicle control, there were similar discontinuation rates. Um, in the terms of the follow-up phase three study, a larger study with over 450 patients, we basically see uh, consistent results with the phase two data. So again, almost 80% of patients achieving IgA success, 50% um, um, uh, achieving IgA of clear at week eight as well. And then again, uh, you know, to, to emphasize low rates of treatment emergent adverse events. So, you know, 2.6% actually uh, slightly less than the vehicle in this study. And here's just one example of a patient on top with a primarily involvement of the, the glabella, and then a, a patient uh, with seborrheic dermatitis, skin of color with initial hypopigmentation that uh, normalized over the course of treatment. And so, you know, applying translational approaches to seborrheic dermatitis, you know, so far these advances have largely been lacking. Um, and so, you know, these current treatment approaches are helping to generate hypotheses in terms of the pathogenic processes in, in uh, seborrheic dermatitis. And, you know, it, it, we, it's uh, fair to question whether the current treatments are helpful in understanding that. But in general, at this point, you know, the, the use of topical steroids, it's, uh, it's not very helpful from the translational perspective because it's too broad acting. So uh, not only does it uh, decrease uh, innate uh, and adaptive immunity, but it can even impact vasodilation and, and affect the erythema component of the treatment. PDE4 inhibition, which is really right now the leading approach uh, in terms of investigational treatments, um, isn't specific to any individual TH pathway. Um, you know, for example, TH17 can, but it uh, can also target uh, activated T cells of uh, various varieties. And so, um, you know, the, the success with treatment supports the hypothesis that, the, that this is uh, driven by adaptive immunity, not innate, but doesn't give us further detail uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, there are some investigational treatments also. So these are just two registered in uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, one using an antimicrobial peptide and uh, photodynamic therapy as well. Um, there was recently uh, presented a very small case series of Tepinarov in, in three patients, aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonist that is approved for psoriasis, and all three of these patients improve with daily treatment, and here's uh, one example uh, shown. And then, you know, at Mount Sinai, we are interested in understanding the, this disease and, and contributing to new treatments. And so we've initiated an investigator-initiated study with topical ruxolitinib and uh, a, a collaborative study with Pfizer uh, with a novel PDE4 inhibitor. And so in sum, you know, one of the most common inflammatory skin diseases is seborrheic dermatitis, uh, especially in skin of color. The understanding currently of pathophysiology is limited, and hopefully that will change uh, in the future. But these translational approaches may um, help to yield additional therapeutic targets 
and with therapeutic targets and understanding how it modulates the disease pathology will gain better understanding of the disease as well. And overall, safe, effective treatments are currently lacking, particularly for that moderate to severe disease. So this is an area that still needs effort to develop new treatments. Now, with that said, I'll move on to rosacea. And similarly, it'll give us some background again. So, you know, rosacea is a chronic inflammatory disease, primarily affecting the central face and eyes. It's characterized by persistent erythema, inflammatory papules and pustules, telangiectasia, uh, fiminous changes, and ocular uh, features as well. Historically, rosacea has been classified into four subtypes listed here. Um, but because of the clinical variability, the fact that many patients have features of different types, uh, there is a new kind of approach in terms of a diagnostic paradigm that um, there should be generally a shift towards it to, to characterize this disease better. And so um, the new diagnostic paradigm is um, based on one of two diagnostic features. So persistent centrofacial erythema with periodic intensification by potential trigger factors um, or Climatus changes. And then in the absence of the two diagnostic features, uh, two major features can yield the diagnosis um, as well listed here. Uh, and minor features that can uh, aid with diagnosis include you know, burning, stinging, edema, and dry sensation of the skin. And so overall, rather than subtyping rosacea, there's more of a description of the kind of phenotypic characteristics that an individual patient may be experiencing. Rosacea has a very significant negative psychosocial impact affecting quality of life. Patients with rosacea are more likely to experience depression, embarrassment, social phobia, stress. It's very, very common. And again, I wanna emphasize this because you know, we need to develop uh, treatments for rosacea for the large number of patients uh, that are suffering from this condition. So um, you know, estimated to affect 16 million Americans, uh, some, uh, survey studies uh, estimate the, the prevalence at about 2%, um, but, but that can range anywhere from 2 to 22%, depending on the population. Uh, one study looked at uh, uh, women in four different international cities and found you know, rates of uh, rosacea in the 10 to 16% uh, range. Um, and I think you know, pretty consistently studies are, are setting a floor of about 2% prevalence, and it is likely that there's an un underestimation for the, the overall uh, prevalence. So rosacea in skin of color is also very important to consider. So this was one study that looked at patients, um, rosacea patients, and, and found that, you know, uh, it was a little less common in skin of color. However, you know, worldwide reported prevalences and estimates have actually uh, shown very high rates. And in some populations, for example, in China, up to 10%. Uh, there was one study done in Estonia that found an overall prevalence of 20% uh, in terms of uh, rosacea, and a very large subset of these patients were in Fitzpatrick types, uh, skin types three and four. And so this particular uh, study uh, cited below that looked at uh, rosacea in, in skin of color concluded, and I strongly agree with this conclusion, that you know, current reports of rosacea um, in patients with skin of color point to a large pool of underdiagnosed patients. And so as we move forward, I think it's uh, very important that we increasingly recognize and are cognizant of this issue. So the pathophysiology of rosacea is, is similar to seborrheic dermatitis. It's still under investigation. There's been a little more work done to characterize it. Um, and one of the things that has been found is that there's elevated Th1 and Th17 pathway genes. So this was one study looking at uh, transcriptional expression. And so here in the middle, you know, the Th1 and Th17 inflammation was most prominent in the papulopustular phenotype, but importantly, it was also seen in the erythematotelangiectatic phenotype and phimidus as well. This was another uh, study that uh, compared uh, expression of, of genes in rosacea versus healthy controls, found elevated Th17 and Th17 related pathway genes. Uh, as well as um, decreased expression of certain barrier-related genes, so claudins, flagrin, and loricrin as well. So this is a kind of an overall schematic of some of the uh, factors that are believed to play a role in the rosacea um, pathogenesis. So um, there is, you know, elevated macrophages, neutrophils, mast cells, plasma cells, so innate immune system activation. As I mentioned, increased Th17 and Th1. Um, Demodex and other microbes are also hypothesized to play a role, you know, uh, potentially through stimulation of TLR2 and PAR2, 
uh, leading to upregulation of uh, inflammasomes and LL37 or cathelicidin, as well as inflammation and angiogenesis. And then lastly, in parallel, stress and other stimuli may lead to neurogenic inflammation and vasodilation via stimulation of TRPV1, TRPA1, and others. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, there's also barrier dysfunction. And so all of these um, have some role contributing uh, to the pathomechanisms underlying rosacea. The current approved treatments, uh, FDA approved treatments for rosacea are listed. And there, there are several. Most of them target the inflammatory phenotype of rosacea. And um, as you'll note, they primarily approach the targeting the antimicrobial and, and therefore anti-inflammatory um, components of the disease pathology. I'm not gonna go through all the details of these different treatments, but I do want to note that uh, as you go through them, you'll see that it's definitely not the case that any single treatment is um, you know, leading to tremendous success for all patients. Uh, they're, it's a, they're effective for, for many patients, but uh, there's still you know, a need for you know, better treatments, as well as treatments with lower rates of side effects as well. And so here are additionally two newer approved treatments, minocycline foam and encapsulated benzoyl peroxide, again, showing that there are you know, some progress uh, in this area, but still more is needed. For the erythema phenotype, perhaps uh, even there's an even greater necessity. So there, there are two approved treatments uh, listed here. Uh, neither of these have a long-term improvement uh, for the, the erythema. Um, and as you can see, there's still a, a great need for more effective treatments as well as those without side effects. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some of the treatments that are currently being studied. You know, results for some of them, uh, preliminary results are available. Many of them have not published results yet. And, and so I'm not gonna go through the results per se, but I wanna at least raise the, the fact that, you know, different treatment approaches are being uh, studied. And as you'll see, there's a, a number of different approaches kind of highlighting that this is a very complex um, disease. And so we'll, we'll certainly have to see which ones work, which ones don't, and put that together to, to yield better understanding of the disease pathology. So some of the treatments that are targeting inflammatory components of the disease uh, include um, you know, inhibiting TLR2 and a G protein coupled receptor signaling, a treatment that uses a, a manganese-based porphyrin uh, with a, a ROS inhibitor, there are several different PDE4 inhibitors that are being evaluated as well. There's a topical proteasome inhibitor, um, a systemic um, monoclonal antibody, secukinumab, targeting um, IL-17. There are additional treatments looking at the microbial or microbiome component of the disease pathology. So um, a topical application of a specific um, ammonium oxidizing bacterium, um, antimicrobial peptide, oral antibiotics, and then a um, modified release um, minocycline uh, formulation as well. Targeting the erythema and neurogenic components, again, we'll see different approaches and mechanisms. So topical MAPK MEK inhibitor, anti-CGRP monoclonal antibody, uh, VEG uh, FR2 inhibitor, and TRPV1 inhibitor as well. In summary, as you can see from the, the approaches that are being employed, um, there are many different mechanisms being targeted. And again, that really highlights that this is a very complex uh, disease. The fact that we have these different approaches, again, may help us understand the disease better, but also points to the idea that, you know, we don't yet know the central pathogenic processes that are really driving this disease. Um, it may ultimately be a disease that divides into different endotypes requiring personalized approaches rather than one treatment that will be used uh, to treat everyone. And, you know, currently, although several treatments have been approved by the FDA, you know, the overall efficacy and side effect profiles are lacking and we need better treatments. And, you know, one thing I will just say as an aside is that I didn't really go into the ocular manifestations of this disease uh, since, you know, from the dermatologic perspective, that's often less focused on. But I think that as we move forward and consider different uh, treatments, that that's something that will need, need to be increasingly recognized as considered, you know, treatment successes. Thank you.